Hey everyone, and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In this episode, we have a very special guest who wanted to share his own personal Bigfoot encounter that took place in the Wachita National Forest just south of Mena, Arkansas. This is a really good interview, and the caller describes his Bigfoot encounter in great detail. This encounter will definitely leave you on the edge of your seat, and I think a lot of people are really going to enjoy listening to this episode. Can you imagine being caught in a situation out in the forest where you're about to lose your life and all of a sudden a Sasquatch comes out of the woods and rescues you? Yeah, that really happened and the caller Bill is very adamant about what happened and you can tell he is dead serious about everything he talks about. For some reason, all of a sudden, none of my videos are doing that well and the channel is kind of falling apart so if you guys can please like and subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification if possible a lot of people have mentioned that they are mysteriously being unsubscribed and they are not getting notifications for the channel i've tried contacting youtube about the issue but they just give me the same generic answers if you guys have a bigfoot encounter that you would like to share please contact me sometime and i would really like to hear about it all right, guys, let's dive straight into this next interview here on Sasquatch Theory. All right, Bill, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fairly well today, sir. Good, good to hear. And um, Bill, if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself and your Bigfoot encounter from the very beginning, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Bill Nolock. I'm 64 years old. Uh, I was born and raised in Northeast Ohio, uh, raised in Toledo, uh, about five miles away from the Michigan line. Uh, I was raised from the very beginning of, uh, uh, to be uh, out fishing, camping, hiking. Uh, I started trapping when I was like nine, ten years old. I become a very good trapper. Uh, I started hunting when I was about 13 to 14 years old and spent uh, a few years in the woods uh, doing a lot of hunting. Uh, I come from a family of 10 children, five girls and five boys. Uh, basically, uh, when I was uh, 16 years old, a call come in from my aunt who lived in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, I'm sorry just outside of Mena, Arkansas. And she was going to travel to Little Rock, Arkansas for an operation. And uh, she needed somebody to come uh, to her place there near Mena, Arkansas to take care of her property and her animals, so forth and so on, until she was able to be released from the hospital after her operation. And I volunteered. So this was approximately March 1st. Uh, 1976, and uh, I was 16 years old. I was responsible, and my parents agreed it was okay. So I drove with my sister, my older sister. We drove to uh, my aunt's place uh, near Mena, Arkansas. My sister spent the night to return home to Ohio. I stayed there, spent the next few days, acclimated myself to the property, the surroundings, and her property basically sat right up against the Washita, some people call it the Washita National Forest. Uh, she had 28 acres. Uh, she had goats. She had chickens, dogs, cats. Uh, she had a few ducks. Uh, I mean, uh, so her place needed to be tended to while she was gone. And uh, I was going to be staying there. Uh, March 6th, my aunt leaves for Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm there on my own. And uh, everything's going fine. I'm, you know, I'm getting used to the place, getting up early every morning, tending to the animals. I wake up the morning of March 8th. is my birthday. And I decide I'm going to feed all the animals and take a hike into the forest. Uh, I've spent many, many hundreds of hours hiking in, in the woods. And I ju it's just something I love to do. So 
that morning when I woke about six o'clock, I tended to the animals and I think it was around 6.30. I threw on my backpack, my gear, water, snacks, compass. And I even had a 357 that I strapped on and went way into the forest I went. And uh, it was absolutely serene, beautiful. It was uh, some overcast, rained lightly for a little bit, then it let up, and I was just covering ground. It was one of the most beautiful places I'd ever seen. And uh, finally, I found myself down in what you might consider a small valley. I wanted to make my way up to the ridge, uh, which looked like quite a hike. And this is about three hours into the hike. And I uh, basically start making my way up. Well, after about another hour, I realized what I was in for because that ridge was a lot higher than I than it looked like from down below from where I was. And I had noticed along the way that I hadn't seen any animals. I hadn't heard any animals. I hadn't heard anything. But nevertheless, it was beautiful. And I wasn't on any trails. I had to make my own way. It was about, I would say, somewhere around 1230. I made my way to the top. And just before making my way to the top of the ridge, I had heard machine noises. Something didn't make any sense. I was hearing this, these, it sounded like may possibly saws running. And I heard equipment running. And I'm thinking, well, geez, am I that close to a highway or something? And I get to the top of the ridge and I look down and well, about a half a mile away down on the other side of the ridge was a logging crew that was uh, taken out. It turned out to be about 20 acres of timber. As I'm looking at them, looking at the operation they have going on, I turn and I'm startled because to the left of me, in the crotch of a tree, is a buck hanging in the crotch of a tree. And I just, I hunted, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in the woods and it, it, you know, it had quite a bit of blood on it. It didn't make any sense to me. And it was about eight foot high. I walked up, raised my hand all the way up and I could touch it. I'm about six foot tall. And uh, I thought that to be extremely odd. Who would, you know, who would dispatch a, a deer like this and put it in the crotch of a tree? Uh, maybe it's somebody that couldn't move it they're going to go get help and come back and get it it seemed to be relatively fresh well i decided to hike on down the other side and make my way to uh the landing there where this operation this logging operation was going on and as soon as i arrived uh i was met by three of the gentlemen who worked there that didn't appear to be too happy with my presence and uh, I introduced myself, and uh, two of them gave me their first names and asked me who I was, where I was from, what I'm doing there. Because um, at that point, which I didn't realize, uh, over eight miles back into the forest, and uh, I didn't even realize they had a road going back there from the hike I had taken. And uh, after speaking with them for approximately 10 minutes, I understood why they approached me the way they did and was asking me the questions is because they had equipment there that uh, somebody had uh, basically moved and tried to destroy, it appeared, uh, and had done several thousand dollars worth of damage to their equipment. Uh, I had walked over with them. They had showed me... Uh, some of the things that were damaged and i was really really taken back because i'm familiar with a couple pieces of the equipment and had seen the damage that was done to them and couldn't rationalize in my mind who could have done it or how they could have done it it was it was pretty incredible and uh at that time a truck had pulled in and a gentleman stepped out of the truck. It turned out to be, I believe it was his name, first name was Dave. And he was the foreman of the crew there. And he come up and introduced himself. And, I'll, and you know, and I introduced myself when we're speaking. And, you know, and I told him, I said, you know, I had seen something very strange up in the ridge over here. I said, there's a deer hanging in the cracks of the tree. And when I did, the three gentlemen standing there all looked at each other and looked at me. 
And I said, he said, uh, was it a buck? And I said, yeah. He said, well, oddly enough, one staggered into our site here yesterday, last night before we was getting ready to leave. And uh, I was going to be here for a few more hours, the foreman said. He said, and it was injured. And I took my rifle out of my truck and I just backed it. He says, three hours, about three hours later, everybody had left when I got ready to leave. The deer was gone. Well, I had spoke with them about the deer, and they asked me about where it was, and I told them, they said, could you take us up there? And I said, uh, I really didn't want to hike all the way back up the way I just come from, but I agreed. I said, sure. So the foreman, Dave, and then one of the other gentlemen come with me, and away we went. And it took about 20 to 30 minutes to hike back up there, and we get up there. And the foreman walks right up and he reaches up and he touches the deer and he walks around to the other side. And he said, that's the one I shot. That's the one I dispatched. It was down at the site. As soon as he said that, there was a noise that came about. And I've never heard it before. I've never heard it since. It was like a real low tone growl. And it lasted. You could feel it. And it went on and on. This thing had to go on for like 15 seconds straight. You know, we're all looking around. You know, we don't see anything. We're looking around. And the foreman insists immediately, let's go, go, go. And I'm thinking, uh, okay, you know, so away we go. I said, well, you know, what the hell was that? You haven't yet. He says, well, um, uh, no, no, I don't know what it was, but it's just that it's good that we get out of there. He said, I'm glad you got that pistol on your hip. I thought, wow, that's strange for him to say something like that. And away we went. I mean, these guys were moving, you know, like getting down back to the site, back to the landing. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, we get down there and we start discussing it. And they're talking to the other guys that are there. There's like three other guys. And they're all looking up in the direction we had come from. And they had, you know, disturbed looks on their faces. It was it was kind of strange. The one gentleman had walked up that had went up there with me and said, you know, you ought to basically hang out here. We'll be leaving in two, three hours. He says, and uh, you could ride out with us. And I said, well, I, you know, thank you. But, um, you know, I'm just going to make my way back. Now that I see the road here, this, you know, I think I can get over halfway back from where I come from, uh, possibly taking this because this road was basically cut into the side of the mountain. And it was, you know, eight feet wide, maybe. And on one side, it went straight up and basically eight, ten feet on the other side, straight down. And I'm talking down, sharp. And I told him, I said, you know, I tell you what, I'm just going to basically hike my way back on out. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the offer. Uh, but, you know, I'm just going to be on my way. And they said, oh, uh, uh, one gentleman said, to me, you wouldn't catch me up here. And I thought, whoa, whoa, why is that? He said, well, you just wouldn't. He said, it's a, you know, it's a dangerous place to be. And I thought, well, it's the forest, you know. I said, can, you know, can you tell me what you mean by that? He said, well, I don't know. It's just, you know, you can get hurt back in here. And, you know, it's it, it's a dangerous place. And I, I thought, well, you know, okay, you know, well, I'll use caution. And, you know, I'm going to be on my way. And they said, okay, well, if I was you, I would just stay on the logging road till you get out and make your way back to wherever you come from. He said, I wouldn't leave the road. I said, okay, you know, well, we'll see how that goes. About five minutes later, I grabbed my pack, throw it over my shoulder. I head down the logging road. Everything's fine. Everything, I mean, it had rained a little bit again, let back up, cloudy, probably somewhere in the 50s. And I'm making my way down the logging road, and I thought, wow, this is pretty amazing. You know what I mean? This is, this is pretty cool. The way they've made this road, I've never seen anything like that. And I'm making my way down the road. I get about, I'd say, a mile and a half down. And there's a big landing, a big flat landing off to the right. And there's a piece of equipment sitting there. And they have two stacks of cut timber on this plateau, if you will, that goes off to the right from the mountain. And it's... Two stacks of timber, I'll say somewhere around 60 to 80 feet wide. And it goes back probably, I'd say, 80 to 100 feet. And whoop, straight down you go. And I'm thinking, how did they stack these timbers here without them falling off the mountain? That's pretty incredible. You know what I mean? 
So I take off my backpack, sit it down, bottle of water, I set that down. And it's about 20 feet high, maybe just over, maybe closer to 25 feet high. And they had this piece of equipment there that used for picking up the logs and sitting them on a truck or trailer or whatnot. And also I discovered they had a helicopter that was working with them back there too when they needed it. So I climbed up, I get to the top and the view was spectacular. And I'm walking towards the back and I'm over on the right side and I hear a noise. And if I don't, I can't explain it other than rewinding a cassette tape. When you're listening to a cassette, and you rewind it. And I've never heard it. And I mean, clear, clear, loud. You, uh, it, uh, I'd never heard anything like it before. It was like, you know, it was, it was bizarre to me. Now I'm looking, I can't see anything. I'm looking down, I don't see anything. I start walking towards the back. And now I hear the noise again. Now it's coming from my left. Definitely these noises are coming from two locations. And I'm thinking, well, did this, where, did it come from here and then go over there? And me? So I'm looking over in the other direction to the left. I'm approaching the back. Now, now it comes to me, what's holding these trees in place? Because at the rear, I'm telling you, it takes a dip and goes down in a couple hundred feet. And it's very steep. And I get near the back. I'm about five foot from the rear. And I'm looking over. And I just heard these second noises that were bizarre to me. Again, a cassette running and fast reversed where you hear the voices, where you hear the noises of the voices, rather. And I see there's three trees at the back holding the timbers up. One is standing there that's holding up the stack on the left side. And there's two on the right side that have been bent over and broke. It's like something or someone grabbed them. Pulled them over and broke them about 10 inches wide. Now I'm thinking, well, that, that's kind of bizarre. You know, maybe they did it with the equipment before they start bringing the trees back in here to stack them up. But that don't make any sense because they're broke off lower than the height of the stacks of timber. I hear another noise coming back from the right again, but now it's that growl sound again. It's real low tone, shorter this time, three, four seconds. But, buddy, I'm telling you, not only did I hear it, I felt it. So I'm thinking, I'm getting the hell out of here. So I walk over to the left side of timber to look down because I'm on the right side of stacked timber. I make my way over there, and as I'm looking down, I don't see anything. And I turn, face the way I come from, about six, eight feet from the back, the very rear. And the timbers let go. And I was along for the ride. I uh, remember uh, getting hit two or three times by trees that were rolling down the hill. And then it come to a rest. Everything come to a stop. I'm laying there with three trees across the top of me. I'm bleeding pretty bad. And I can't breathe. The one's coming across my chest. And I, you know, most of my life I was accident prone. I was always the one getting hurt, broken bones, getting stitches. But I knew when I come to a rest and after laying there for several seconds that I was in very, very deep trouble. Because I got blood literally pouring out of my right shoulder. I knew I had broken bones. I didn't realize how many until later on. It was 13. All my ribs were crushed. Most of them, rather, I think eight or nine of them. And I'm laying there looking up thinking, what in the hell am I going to do? I can't move. I can't breathe. My right wrist is broke. Uh, my right arm's fractured. I take my left, I reach over and grab onto my shoulder to stop the bleeding. It's just pouring out like in sheets. And I'm holding it there and I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? Within probably two, three minutes, 
I realize now I can't get any oxygen. I'm in big trouble here. I mean, I've never been in a situation like this in my life. And I know that if I don't get help, and I don't get help relatively quick, eventually they'll find me there. And I'll be deceased. Within a minute or two after that, uh, my mouth was filling with blood. I turned my head to the left. Blood's pouring out of my mouth. I'm trying to breathe in through my nose. I can barely get any oxygen at all. And then I, and then I hear a sound from below, snapping, crunching, and I'm thinking, oh my God, it's one of the loggers. It's one of the loggers. They were nearby. They heard the timber let go. I'm going, I'm going to get help. I can't make any noise. I can't yell. Can't do nothing. Fighting for every little bit of air I can get. And this noise gets louder. And it gets closer. And uh, I could tell it was coming towards me. Again, I believe it could be one of the loggers. And uh, next thing you know, I, through the opening in the trees where they had stopped, I glance to my left and I see something that don't make any sense to me. There's something there. It's either wearing a fur coat or it's covered in hair. And then I raise my head a little bit farther and uh, I could uh, I, I could see its face. And when I did it, I tried with every bit of energy I had to scream, and I spit blood about two feet. Lost all my bodily functions. And cannot explain to you or say what I was looking at. But it was a monster, something I'd never witnessed. On the left side of its face, from next to its eye, coming down next to its nose, across its mouth, had a deep indentation. It looked like where it was terribly injured at one time. It leans over. It's about three, four foot away. It's looking through the opening. right at me and uh, I tried screaming again and all I could do was blood pouring out of my mouth and so I shut my eyes and knew right then and there that I would die there because there's no way this has happened it can't happen it's impossible for something like this to happen when people talk about horror, when they talk about fear, no, 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 no. What happens is I found my brain trying to recalibrate over and over and over, faster and faster, what was happening. What I was looking at, it didn't make any sense. It can't be. It's impossible. And I left my eyes closed. This thing grabbed one of those trees. And it was one of the smaller ones. And I opened up my right eye. And I seen the tree moving. And I thought, what in the hell? And it takes it. And it lifts it up. And it throws it behind it. And I felt it when it hit the ground. And then those noises of the reverse cassette come out again. Louder this time. 
and it's coming from this thing standing next to me, down below me, off to the left, maybe 40, 50 yards. It's like they're communicating in some way. And they do this back and forth three, four times. Well, then it grabs another tree and pushes it. And it slides down out of the way, goes tumbling down the hill. I feel it hitting the other trees below me. But now, but now, there's a tree laying there, the one coming across my chest. And it's a little bit smaller in circumference of a 55-gallon drum. I'd say 25 to 30 feet long. And this thing reached down under it. Wrapped its other arm from the top around it. Its arm wasn't three foot away from me. And it lifted. And it made a noise like I've never heard before. And it was like it was in a struggle dealing with this tree. I, I can't explain it. It was lifting it. And then it ducks down and throws it behind it. When it did, my body, when it hit the trees, after it threw it, when it landed and hit the trees, my body jumped up, moved up two, three inches from the jolt of that tree hitting because there was other trees below me. And now, for the first time, I could get some oxygen through my nose. I could get some oxygen, not much, but a little bit. And the pain had lifted quite a bit. I'm looking to the left. This thing has turned. I'm looking at its back. It's standing there. And I hear an engine from something coming down the mountain or coming up the mountain. It got to where I was, stopped, and two of the loggers, turns out, was coming down the road. Seen my backpack and my water bottle, stopped, got out, yelled my name two, three times. There's no way I could reply. Next thing, which I didn't know, one of them had climbed up to the top of the timber, took two, three steps, turned, yelled to the other gentleman that was in the truck, apparently. We got a slide here. We got a mess to clean up. And he yells my name two or three more times. Apparently, he had taken a couple more steps, and then he yelled, Oh, my God. And that's all I heard. That's all I heard. Next thing I hear is his truck screaming, taking off, racing, taking off. Down, down. I'm thinking, I'm, oh, my God, that was my chance for help. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? Well, there was no way they could turn around where the truck was. They had apparently i found out later had went down about a quarter mile turned around and raced back up i heard them come back by flying up going back to the landing where the logging operation was and then as they do this i look and this thing jumps and when it jumps i don't know how much ground it had covered but when it landed it had went out of my view and you could hear it hitting the trees. Then there was these vocalizations, apparently, back and forth two, three times. And then I could hear whatever they were making their way from where they were to the left of me, where I was laying, down to the right, down in the lower area. That was about another couple hundred foot down from me. It appeared to be multiple of uh, multiple monsters, if you will, because the one that had come up and pulled those trees off, I tell you, was more man than anything I've ever seen. From its facial features to the way it acted, the intelligence it used, 
But let me tell you, I fought for over two decades about if it was better for me to make it out of that situation or pass away laying there for what I had to live with. Next thing I know, there's two trucks flying down the, the road, get to where the logs are, where I'm at. They come to a stop. Three, four guys jump up, running around. After about five minutes, come to the back, look where the worst part of the slide is, and see me. It took them, and what they call, they call this place called, these people from Mountain Rescue, they all come in. It took another 20 minutes to get me out of there, 30 minutes. They got me out. And then they had transferred me to the closest hospital where I spent uh, 17 days, 16 or 17 days. Uh, I was in pretty bad shape. But uh, the thing is, as I talked to Dave, the foreman of the uh, logging crew, when I was in the hospital, him and three of the other guys come up to see me. And they had uh, they had seen these these things before in the woods where they were doing their logging, and uh, how ironic he says it was that it happened the way it happened because if they would have found me with the trees in place across me the way they were, they would have had to get the equipment, get it down there, figure out how to get it close to me, figure out how to use it to get the trees off me. He said, you're talking hours, hours. He says, when we found you, you just had to be picked up, put on a stretcher and carried out. He said, so I'm not going to ask you, you know, he said, it's kind of ironic you have that kind of a slide, he said, and you'd wind up laying there with nothing on top of you. He says, uh, is there anything you want to tell me? I said, no, all I remember is being caught in a slide and then waking up and you guys were there because I believed with every bit of my being, especially after I come home. And if I had told people what I seen, what had happened to me, I believed I'd be put in a rubber room or something. I, you know, I, I just couldn't say. I couldn't. I couldn't tell anyone and finally after telling my father after returning home about a week later you know he looked me in the eye and said keep it to yourself son just keep it to yourself you know so I see so many times that they have these things out there you know Reaping havoc, you know, causing trouble, scaring people, even killing people. I see it on there. They have all these sites, these monsters. These things, whatever they are, are intelligent. You know, they're, I'm telling you, they're, what I've seen and I experienced, I live with today. I'm 64. This happened on my 17th birthday. But I tell you, I finally reached a point after decades of being, being happy, you know, being, being able to live. Being, you know, I, I, you still won't catch me camping. You, you know, you still won't catch me hiking in a forest by myself. You know, it changed my life forever. You know, but... Uh, these beings, these creatures, wherever they come from, whatever they are, are intelligent. And uh, 
I'm a living witness that uh, they can help us in whatever way they can help us because I believe that day in that situation that creature saved my life you know and I never believed I would have got out of there in the situation I was in but this thing climbed up there and physically removed three trees and one of so help me I wouldn't be surprised if it was less than a ton you know this thing had to be close to four foot across in the chest it was huge but looking at its face he was human you know yeah you know the eyes were large the nose was large the mouth was large but it had less hair over its face than any other part of its body and, uh, when you have to live with something like that you know experience something like that you know uh, i went through years and years of panic attacks nightmares night terrors doctors 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 medication 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 like i said uh, we even went through hypnosis regression after the first session two doctors i was seeing said sorry we got to hand your case off we're, we're not specialized to handle anything like this <laughs> but uh, you know that's about it i just you know i'm happy to be alive i still live with it on a day-to-day -day basis and uh you know finally i've reached a point in my life where I'm happy, uh, you know, uh, it turned out to be the best thing because if it wouldn't have happened the way it did, I, I don't think I'd be here. But when you got to be up close and personal with something like that, where it's a few foot from you and you're looking at it, it's going to change you forever. You know, again, that's why I tell people. You know, you're in a big hurry to go out and hunt these things down and find them. I guess there's even groups of people out there looking to hunt one down and kill it. Uh, you know, I, you know, I got to ask myself. You know, over all the years, I've I've talked to several people who've had very up close personal experiences with these things, and uh, you know, again. People, you know, I don't think people know what they're asking for to have an interaction with these things. Because, you know, you know, I know there has to be, there has to be a, a large amount of these things out there who's watched family members die from a bow, from a rifle, from being hit by a vehicle. Uh, and I don't think they forget things like that. You know what I mean? So I think experiencing one of them you could get a or you could get z and uh you want to be there you know when that happens uh, because let me tell you it's, it's going to change your life and it's going to change your life forever every day uh, and then you're going to have to learn how to deal with it because let me tell you something the hours i've spent with specialists doctors you know, over, you know, uh, the PTSD and the sleeping disorders and the night terrors. Uh, and when I experience those things, it's like I'm laying there and it's happening right now. And uh, it's, it's still, you know, it's still absolutely terrifying. But in the same, in the same sentence, I can say they're extremely intelligent. And uh, there's some of them out there willing to help people because without that monster's help that day, I would be talking to you right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bill, I'm glad you made it through that. And I feel like we're here today so you can share your encounter and possibly help other people out, people who are searching for these creatures or maybe somebody who experienced the same thing. Um, you said this happened in Mena, Arkansas, is that correct? Well, uh, about, I would say around 
seven miles. I would say about seven miles northeast of Mina is where her property was. And it butted right up against the Washita National Forest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I took a report from a girl. Her name was Carrie, and she's from Mina, Arkansas. And she said they were fishing at the river, and um, they were having rocks thrown at them. And they were landing in the river, but they could never figure out what it was. But this kind of confirms that they are in that town. They're in the area, and um, they're very territorial. Well, I tell you, Miguel, uh, five years after that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, nine years after that happened, I, I visited the same location. And uh, about four miles away from my aunt's place, I talked with a gentleman. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to say his name, but he would take walks two, three times a week. He was uh, uh, 72 years old and he would take walks uh, into the forest two, three times a week. And he he told me about an encounter he had that was just absolutely incredible. And. Uh, Again, uh, you know, he was within, you know, 15 feet of this creature. The creature made it fully aware he was there. And uh, it was kind of unique what this older gentleman did, you know, to basically uh, try to convey to this thing that he was his friend. He wasn't there to hurt him. Uh, you know, just, you know, basically wants to share the woods with him. And uh, he got through it, no problem, but no problem. But when, when he explained that encounter, it was just absolutely amazing because, you know, I understand a lot of these people encountered these creatures and they're able to walk away. They're able to run away. They're able to drive away. I could do none of that. Nothing. I didn't know if this creature was there to take me. To help me, I had no idea. But to this day, you know, I actually have taken recordings of trying to make the sounds that they made. Uh, again, when they were conversing, it seemed like when they they were talking, and I come pretty damn close, pretty damn close, and it was very, very unique, you know. Uh, but again, you know what I'm saying, I. I know people that had horrifying encounters with them. Uh, but, you know, if I, you know, I think if, if I ever had a chance to encounter one again, it'd be, you know, it'd be totally different because I would, obviously I wouldn't be in the situation I was in. Uh, they were amazed that I lived the damage that was done to me. Uh, when I got there, I had virtually no blood pressure. Uh, I had lost uh, almost 40% of my blood. Uh, the amount of broken bones. Uh, but I tell you this, uh, when I wake up and I'm soaked to the gills with sweat and I wake up from a nightmare and I see, I vision this thing lifting that last tree, it's it's just something that's etched in your memory. It's never going anywhere. It's going to be with you the rest of your life. And finally, I've got to a point, and I've been there a while now that, you know, I can live with that, you know, uh, because when I was young, I was a kid, you know what I mean? And it's kind of unique because three years after that event, I got friends that I always hunted with, I always fished with, hiked with, camped with. And we went camping a few years later. And a friend of mine, Dennis, at two in the morning, had made his way back to the SUV. And found me in the back seat, huddled down on the floor of the SUV. And I tried to explain to him that I was looking for something. Well, I wasn't looking for anything. That's where I had intended on spending the night. Because I, I couldn't stay in the woods, you know. And when you have to, you know, finally, years later, explain that to people that you know that were your friends, so forth and so on. It's, you know, I've had a couple basically say, well, you, you know, I don't know what you were taking. I don't know what you're on or I don't know what you were smoking. But when you come across it again, give some to me. And then I've had a couple that have been compassionate and understand and believe me, you know, and uh, that's a tough thing to go through. 
you know, because back then, you know, it was kind of unique. I forget how old I was, but my father had taken us to see the legend of Boggy Creek. And that stuck with me for a long time. And I always thought, yeah, I make believe there's, you know, they just made that up. I had no idea how much, how much reality was in that documentary. You know what I mean? Uh, but afterwards, I, you know, it took about almost a decade. I did, I did a little bit of research on my own and, uh, you know, like I say, I, I've talked to several people that have told me, oh, my God, some stories that are just amazing. Matter of fact, there's a gentleman in uh, uh, southern Ohio, I think near the West Virginia line is where it is, that uh, that actually uh, uh has a relationship with one of these creatures. They've been on their property for al almost 50 years. And uh, it's not like they go out to dig or anything, but but they actually, you know, he's come close within a few feet of it. He says over a dozen times. And uh, uh, again, on the other side of the coin, you know, who knows which kind of creature you're going to run into. Are you going to run into a creature who's it's seen one of its family members be slaughtered? You know, uh, uh, you just don't want nothing to do with humans at all. I don't know. But I tell you this, they're real. They're out there. And what people have to deal with is what they have to what, after they experience something like that, like I said, what what happens afterwards? Because, like I said, I'm just about 65. I'm almost 65 now. I deal with it every single day. You know, when I sleep, I, you know, I got to prop myself up because I'll fall to the right or fall to the left. Because for the last 50 years, almost 50 years, when I lay down in bed to go to sleep, I lay there for four or five hours and I close my eyes. I, I can't sleep laying down like that. So, you know, that's just one of the things I went through. But what was interesting in the same note is when they did the hypnosis regression and I got to hear it back on tape. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's really something. You know, it's really, really something. Yeah. Did you remember more than um, what you did in um, your awake state? I had actually, I had actually uh, seen a second one, uh, which I don't recall at all. But in under hypnosis, I did, uh, which they, you know, the uh, psychiatrist I had been working with said obviously it was one communicating with the other. You know, and uh, so the noises you were hearing that was probably them communicating. But I had definitely seen a second one and possibly a third one, which would have been a small one, uh, like a child. Uh, and uh, when I went back there, seeing exactly where I was laying, of course, all the timber was gone. Uh, but this thing, the terrain it had to cover and how it did it on these trees that had slid absolutely amazing incredible because over that plateau where those trees were stacked you know i don't know if i dug my feet in sideways if i could even slide the next 40 50 feet with just out rolling straight down that's how steep it is so uh this thing had a way of digging in however it did to make its way up to me it didn't have to you know uh you know, I've asked myself so many times, was it curious to what it was, what I was, who I was? Uh, did it know I was in trouble? Was it there specifically to take those trees and do what they did with them? Uh, to see something that large in your mind, like I said, my brain was recalibrating so quickly, so many times, trying to figure it out. But when you hear the noise... You hear the noise and you see this thing lift this tree. Oh my God, Miguel. Oh my God. It's like, and then it lets it go. And when it hits the ground, my body boom, jumps forward three, four inches from the ground when it hits. 
it, it's so massive, so big, so heavy. Like I said, if that tree didn't weigh a ton, it did weigh an ounce. You know, and this this this, this creature handled it. You know, and and in doing so, saved probably an operation that might have taken another another five, six, seven, eight hours to get me out. And uh, they, you know, I don't think there's no way I would have made it. No way. Yeah. Did you see them when they initially threw the trees on top of you? Well, they didn't throw the trees on top of me. The mm -hmm. trees wound up on, on top of me because I got caught in a slide from the timbers going down the hill. Me moving them when I was on top of them, walking on them, is what happened. And the trees that were that 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 was being used as a backstop at the rear had been bent over, snapped over, bent down. So the trees were basically sitting there on their own. There was nothing holding them. So when I moved over to the left side at the rear. Little did I realize there was nothing holding them there. When I turned and stepped on the next tree, I kind of jumped, land on the next tree. They let go. See ya. And then I was like in an avalanche of trees. Okay. An avalanche yeah. of, of timbers. That's how I got caught and how, how I got pinned. Okay, that makes sense. Um, when you first found that buck in the crotch of the tree, what went through your mind? I, I couldn't figure out why it was there. I was, you know, I mean, I had hunt for deer before, dispatched deer before, never dispatched anything without using it ever. The meat, whatever. Uh, that's what, that's how I was raised. That's what I was taught. And I thought, you know, it appeared that it was shot, which it was, in fact. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, how long ago was this done? Is somebody coming back to get it? Uh, and that's why I had brought it up to the gentleman down at the, the logging crew, down at the plateau where they were working. And they're all looking at each other. It turned out that the foreman Dave had shot a buck that was injured, severely injured, looked like it had a broken leg. And so he shot it. He planned on taking it home. So that day when everything happened, when he got ready to leave, it was the day before that basically I got there rather. Uh, when he got ready to leave that night, the night before everything happened, he went to get the buck, and it was gone. And that's why he was amazed. He wanted to go back up there and see it. You know, like, come on, you know. But it, thinking back, thinking back, when we went back up there to see it, uh, and we heard that noise, they knew something that I didn't know. I could tell, thinking back, I could tell the, their reaction. You know, the go, 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 go. Let's get out. You know what I mean? Uh, it's like, uh, okay. You know, I mean, we were just shy of running down that hill. Uh, so it felt like they knew something that I didn't. Later on, it turned out they did because they had witnessed something. Uh, and the one, uh, gentleman said the one they had witnessed it was at the very rear of the edge of where the, the you know where they was going to quit cutting timber he said it had to be every bit of nine foot tall it was the biggest thing matter of fact the day they witnessed it it was like 130 they come in closed down the whole operation and left this guy was just panic stricken you know and uh, so they had to close down the operation that day so they had witnessed the creature one of the creatures, uh, you know, probably five days to a week before my event, my encounter happened. So they had witnessed them. Uh, but what come down, you know, what could come down there and grab that buck and just pick up and walk away with it? I don't know, but I'll tell you, like I said, when I first seen it, it made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Never seen anything like it. And like I said, Again, walking up, reaching up, reaching up, and I'm touching it as high as I can reach. And I'm touching it in the crotch of the tree. Just who? Okay, you know who's you know this guy. If somebody killed this buck, I thought as I'm walking down. Before I started walking down, if somebody killed this buck and walked up there and could climb up and throw that buck in the crotch of this tree, 
he must be one strong SOB because that'd be that'd be quite a feat to do. So I was just completely confused about that. You know, I had no idea how it got there. Uh, but it was like, you know, those gentlemen wanted to verify if it was in fact the one that they had shot. And uh, he said it was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he wasn't in no hurry to take it, that's for sure. But he was in a hurry to get the hell off that ridge. Yeah, it you sounds know? like they knew what was going on. And I've heard reports where people find deer with broken legs and they'll come right up to them in their yard. And that's actually happened to me when the Sasquatch were around here. There was a doe that kept coming into the yard and her front wow. leg was broken and dangling. But she would just stand there and look at me and then look behind her in the woods and then look at me and look behind her like something was chasing her and it happened wow. for a few days in a row wow incredible incredible yeah i mean when wildlife does something like that you know you know what i mean you something is not right uh but uh you know i just i got a friend that uh was just in uh, uh on a hunting trip here about uh I'm thinking of, it was like three months ago and uh, they was just up basically looking over an area and uh, had an encounter with something that uh, changed them to where they had bought in that area. They had bought about 60 acres and uh, they went up and had an experience with something and it wasn't like an experience like I had. It was different. But they've already listed the property they purchased for sale. They will not go back. They will not go back. And uh, it's like, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm 64 years old. And the years I spent in different parts of this country, deep in the woods, uh, hiking and camping and stuff like that, um, you know, I got to ask myself, why now? Why now? Is it because the population has grown to the point there's so many more people hiking, camping, fishing, doing the things they're doing that's intruding in the areas where these things live? Because I'm telling you, I never heard anything or anybody talk about anything like that when I was younger. Never. Now it's like Sasquatch, Dogman, you know, it's these rakes. Where in that? What the hell's going on? It would make it just don't make any sense to me. It's like now, why? Why now? You know, it's like because the the reports are everywhere, you know. And then you got you know, it's almost like it's almost like there's been people put in place to be the naysayers. You know what I mean? Because uh, you know, I, I've heard of different people talking and doing things on YouTube and different sites. But if you brought one up and laid it in front of them. They wouldn't believe it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I tell you, you know, but I tell you, once you experience one and everybody knows it, everybody knows it from that day forward, you're never the same. You're never the same. I can understand. I can understand being out hiking and having an interaction with one from 30, 40, 50 yards away where you stop, you look at each other. You're standing there, a minute or two goes by, and then you both go on your way. I can understand, actually, what to go back out. You know what I mean? I can understand that. Uh, because it's just, you know. But I tell you, to be in the situation I was in, uh, again, I didn't, I didn't have a chance to. I mean, when you lose all your bodily functions and you spit blood two feet in the air, uh, I, I can't explain. I can't tell anybody what that's like. You have to live it. And I'm telling you, I pray to God, nobody ever has to live an experience like mine. Because it's like you're locked in, strapped down, you ain't going nowhere. And then you have to endure whatever happens. And like I said, I dealt with you know, asking myself for the better part of two decades, was it better that I survived? You know, waking up screaming, you know, uh, the nightmares, the 
the sleeping disorders and stuff like that. I, I contemplated suicide for so long, for so long. But I finally got the help I needed. I got through all that, you know. And, and uh, you know, my theory in this world is no matter what happens bad, uh, it can always be worse, you know. And uh, I've come to accept that, even in my situation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Number one, it, you know, it's a miracle I even survived, you know. Yeah, yeah I asked myself the same questions when I encountered the Sasquatch here by my place was why me because i've had um paranormal experiences before that and you know i was dealing with like ptsd and all kinds of issues and when i saw that i was like why me because i know no nobody was going to believe me and i just didn't know where to go with it so i just told my stories and it really helped me out to get it off my chest and i started meeting like-minded people so there uh -huh. i guess there's a reason for everything um bill if you could Describe what the Sasquatch look like. What did this Bigfoot look like? I could see it from possible. I, I would say about the waist up. Uh, keeping in mind, most of the time I seen it, I was seeing it side view. I would see most of its full view when it was moving a tree. This thing... I hear people talk about 300 pounds, 400 pounds. This, this creature had to be every ounce of seven to 800 pounds. He had to be three, three and a half. It looked like he looked like the most giant. He looked like the incredible Hulk covered in fur is what he looked like. But he was wide, so wide. His arms were so big around, so long. When he reached in and grabbed that last tree, and his arm come in from underneath in that hand clamp, my mouth just dropped open, blood pouring out of it. I'm thinking, look, look at the size of that hand. Again, his face, looking at the face from the left top, just past his, up near his forehead, down just at the corner of his eye, down just missing the left side of its nose, down to the left side of its mouth, and down to its chin, had an indentation a half inch wide, at least a half inch deep. A scar, it looked like a scar, but it was like a reddish brown fur. And it covered every bit of it right down to its forehead. And then you could see part of its forehead, heavy eyebrow area, and then its face. Extremely large nose, lips, down to its chin, and then it started getting extremely hairy again. Uh, covered with fur and hair. Uh, but it's the face is why I say human, because it's like, it's, even though it scared me almost to death when I first seen it, after, again, your brain recalibrating, calibrating, calibrating, trying to figure out what you're looking at. But I'm telling you, when I seen what I saw, human, 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 it was more human than anything else. Uh, I couldn't, again, I couldn't talk. I couldn't yell help. I couldn't yell nothing. It felt like there was a, a tree that weighed 2,000 pounds laying across my chest. And that's what it was. And that's why I got the relief when it moved that last tree. But seeing it from the waist up, just incredibly huge. It had to be. And I don't know because I seen it from the waist up. But. This thing, again, as much as it looked like a human, you know, with the hair, the size of its chest, the size of its arms, the size of its hands, the facial features, this, this thing had to be every, every bit of eight foot tall. And how it managed to keep its balance on that drop with those timbers that are standing on it to do what he did had to be absolutely incredible. Uh, but 
all I can say is extremely large, extremely strong. Oh, my God. The noise it let out, it was like a bellow when it grabbed that last tree. And all it wanted to do was get it up as high as its shoulder, which it did, and then bent and tossed, let the tree go. And it fell over the top of its head. And when it landed again, my body hit the timbers when it landed, and my body got jolted, you know, two to four inches in the air, you know. And then it turned, and it moved, and it's like it slid. And I could see the side of its head, the side of its face. I could see its right arm. And again, I looked to the right because I hear somebody coming because the truck had pulled up. And one of the guys, which I didn't know, had climbed up, was coming to the back. To look, I heard him yell, we got a slide here. We got a mess. And all of a sudden, out of his mouth, oh, my God. And that's the last thing I heard. Then the truck took off. It turned out the reason the oh, my God came up is because and he seen what I seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was wondering if he saw you or the creature. Well, they came up to see me in the hospital and then they left. And then that gentleman came back in the room. And we talked for like a half an hour. And he said, you know, you can say whatever you want, you know. But I know what happened there. I seen I seen what was there. There's no there's no way. There's no way that slide happened. And you wound up laying there on your own, fighting for your life with nothing on top of you. He said, that's kind of odd, don't you think? I said, no. I said, I had three timbers coming across the top of me. The thing you've seen is what moved them. He just stood there and shook his head, you know, up and down like, yes, you know. He said, yeah. He said, wow. He said, he said he wasn't the gentleman that experienced them at their site. But he knew the guy real well. But seeing that, he said, he said, really, believe it or not, helped me. He said, because when you hear something like that, I knew my buddy I was working with experienced something terrifying that day. Something, something drastic happened. He said, but it all comes together and makes sense when you witness it yourself, you know. Yeah. Did this creature have a round head or was it conical shaped? You mentioned it looked it was, like the hawk covered, the Hulk covered was, in fur. You know, it was more, it was more, uh, I would say, it was kind of like conical and then like flattened off a little bit at the top. Again, there was so much hair, so much fur, you know. I don't know whether to call it hair or fur. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I say hair. Yeah. You know? Were the eyes yeah. big and round like a Coke can or probably bigger? Like, could you see the whites of the eyes or was it more almond shaped and black? Because they, they, were, they come in two different styles or several well, different styles. I, these things... These things, to me, from my where I was, appeared to be tennis balls, the size of tennis balls. And they were more round, and they were black. They were black. I couldn't, I couldn't see no white. Uh, but, but that being said, when it leaned in the first time, and it got within three or four feet of me, it was like, it was almost like it was purposely looking through to see me and when i first made contact with that and i seen those eyes it was like i couldn't see no whites or anything it was all black and that's when i lost my bodily functions and spit blood trying to scream because oh my god oh my god you know yeah it sounds you know, like those loggers were working in a in a research area basically or whatever you'd want to call it where the well, plan was well, living at. Well, they had come 160 miles away to do the job that was contracted, and it had been turned down by two or three other crews, I understand. Uh, and he said, uh, the foreman wound up saying, when he come up to us, he said, that's kind of strange. He said, especially due to what they were paying, you know, to have the work done back there. Uh, but again, you know, when I got to that landing and they said somebody had sabotaged their equipment and i went over one piece of equipment had four belts on it and these belts if you will remind you of like a like a big fan belt on an older car right but they're uh, they're an inch and a half wide uh top to bottom probably close to two inches thick and if you if you took i don't know what it would take to cut one 
they're about four to five hundred dollars a piece. Uh, but these things were ripped right off the machine. Ripped right off the machine. They were snapped, snapped in half. You could take one of these and tow a train car with it. That's how strong it is. You know, but in tearing these belts from that piece of equipment, I had actually drugged a piece of equipment over seven feet. And it weighed close to a thousand pounds. So, you know, it was like if you if you wrapped a chain around those belts and then ran that chain 20 foot to a bumper of a one ton pickup truck and then put it in low gear and punched it, you dragged the machine. I don't think you break the belts. I really don't. And that's where I was first. I, again, I stood there when I was there that whole time there at that landing when I was dealing with the loggers. I was just. I couldn't make any sense of it. You know what I mean? What could tear those belts? And uh, actually, there was only two of them that had broke. But breaking one is amazing. Utterly amazing. The two were broken. These things, you know, are very large. I mean, when, when you buy them, if you would stand on the belt and raise it, it'd come to the top of your head at least. Mm -hmm. Very heavy belts. Sounds like the Bigfoot were upset that the loggers were tearing down their home, and it's kind of like stirring up a beehive. And um, the, in a sense, the Sasquatch have a hive mind. Like when you mess with one, they all seem to know, and they all work together in unison. Yeah, and I would, you know, you know, I love nature so much. I love animals so much. You know, I don't hold any ill will towards any creature like that at all in any way, shape, or form, that you're right, that is, that's their home, you know, that is their home, although all that, you know, that whole area they were working on will be replanted, so forth and so on, and uh, uh, I just, you know, I can understand where, you know, they would, you know, they would be upset, and again, I had no idea that day when I took that hike and had my encounter that I was walking into an area that was 1.8 million acres. You know, and yeah. I thought, I thought to myself, how odd, how odd to be in just on the edge of that massive amount of wilderness and experience something like that. Mm. You know, was it a state park or a national forest? National forest. Okay. Do you know the name of it? Uh, Washita. Okay. Um, yeah. Anytime I've heard that low tone growl, normally that means they're upset and they want you out of the area and possibly Buddy, they have juveniles around. And I tell you, Miguel, when, when, when you, it's one thing to hear something like that, but when you feel it, you don't forget it. Mm -hmm. I felt that. I mean, Oh my God. It's like, you know, it's like the only thing I can compare it to. The only thing that day I could compare it to is when I was at, uh, there's a little town, Near where I live here, it's called uh, Oak Harbor, and they have the they have the county fair. And when they do, guys bring up 30, 40 of the, the um, machines from the national tractor poles. And uh, when they take off in those things, you feel that thing through your whole body. And that's exactly what I felt that day. That's exactly what I felt that day. It's like it wasn't just in my chest; it was in my stomach. It was up to my my arms, up to my neck and my head. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like. It's oh my god! It's just it's very unique, and uh, hey, I you know I don't want to encroach in any way, shape, or form. I, you know, I didn't mean to do any damage, but you know, and I didn't. But uh, I tell you this, you know, after thinking about it afterwards, it's like I I you know I spent literally months, months, years. You know, trying to figure out how it happened, why it happened, how lucky I was that these things came across me first. Because if the logging crew would have come across me first, they can guarantee I wouldn't have made it out of there alive. You know, and they were talking to uh, paramedics at the hospital, you know, and they said, even if we got done, I got a couple IVs in it. It had been, you know, it wouldn't have looked good at all. She, you know, they said you'd have been there a minimum another six, eight hours for us to get in the position to lift those trees off you. Yeah. He says uh, it, it, it wouldn't have been good at all. 
But fortunately, when they got to me, I just needed to be lifted and carried out, you know. And uh, let me tell you something. <laughs> I hope you never have to experience just a punctured lung, let alone having those either 13 or 15 broken bones. Uh, because you literally believe you are in the fight of your life, trying to get oxygen, trying to breathe, you know. And then, you know, when your mouth, your whole throat, you're laying there and your whole throat and your whole mouth fills with blood. And it's doing it slowly. You can taste it. You know what I mean? I, I remember that. I was I was tasting blood. I was tasting blood. And I'm laying there, laying there. Now I hear this noise. It's coming closer to me, so I stop. And I got my head just laying there. But this, this stuff's still coming into my mouth. It's still coming into my mouth, you know. And then it makes its way up to where I could see it. And when it did... You know, my mouth was probably half full. And when I let go, that blood just flew everywhere. It just, oh, my God. To, 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 that, at that moment, at that moment, you know, trying to scream, losing your bodily functions, go, your brain just going on and on. It's just, it's, it's just something that I don't want anybody to ever have to live through, ever. You know, and I feel, I know now how lucky I am, you know what I mean? How blessed I am, how fortunate I am that, uh, you know, this creature came along and did what it did. Because, in essence, it, you know, I believe, you know, I believe it saved my life. You know, uh, it, it, it could have went the other way. And, uh, you know, I had all but before, you know, before I had that encounter, I had all but figured, you know, Okay, you got maybe 20, 30 minutes if you're lucky, you know. And uh, I'll never forget laying there and when that last tree got lifted. I'm sucking in with my nose as much as I can, even though <laughs> I'm still dealing with blood. But it was like I could get just the smallest amount of oxygen, you know. And, oh, my God, all the stuff I ever experienced is like there's just nothing worse than trying to fight to breathe, you know. Yeah. And um, you still carry the scars today from this incident? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I got people, you know, I have, it's like I, like I said, I was always accident prone. And like Thanksgiving, everybody be making their wagers on what what will happen to me this year. You know, I mean, from car accidents to, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, talk, you know, I remember uh, a freak accident happening in Michigan, uh, way up north on a fishing trip where I wound up sewing myself with uh sewing myself up with fishing string. Uh, I just always been accident prone and you know, I got you know, most of my arms from being flipped around, I mean I had poke holes and tear holes in my arms. Most both my arms are mostly scar tissue. Uh that's just what happened to my arms. You know from uh, having the skin ripped off, so forth and so on, dealing with being tossed around through those trees. I couldn't see most of that. Uh, but I did know in my one shoulder that I was uh, definitely losing a lot of blood. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I had no idea how much. I remember by the time I got to the hospital, I basically had blacked out. And uh, it was it what... I woke up when they put the tube down inside and blew my lung up. They, they did somehow. They put a tube down inside me, and uh, they blew air into it. I guess, or was it they put the hole in my back? I can't remember which one. They did. They did two things: one to drain out blood, and one to blow my lung up. And uh, uh, then I, I remember coming too when that happened. But uh being wrapped the way I was wrapped and all the casts and so forth and so on. It was, man, I was a mess. But, uh, you know, I, I've been in trauma centers before that three times. I was almost paralyzed one of those times. And another time I was almost, I was virtually pronounced dead. So, uh, I've been in some pretty bad accidents, you know, uh, but this one here, when this, when this happened, I, oh, well, it just, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, when you get in that situation, it's like going off a road and your car falls down into a ravine 600 feet. 
and it rolls 35 times and you're under the car. You just know, hey, okay, I'm done. And that's what I had basically accepted that day, you know, when that happened. And uh, I thought, man, I had my whole life in front of me. I was sitting there thinking this thing, they're racing through my mind. But let me tell you, partner, when, yeah. when, you, when you look up and see something like I saw, like I said, I'm almost 65, and I've dealt with it every single day from that day. And I probably will to the day I'm gone, you know. But I deal with it now so much better, so much better. It took a long time, you know. But uh, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of thankful because, you know, I knew for the first 10 years after that happened to me, if I talked to anybody about it and told anybody about it, I was a whack job. And I was certainly concerned at the young age, you know, if I would have tried to tell my story, uh, people would have just, you know, everybody would have looked at each other and said, it's time to put him in the rubber room, you know. But now it's acceptable. People talk about it. There's so many experiences. There's so many witnesses. There's so many testimonies to what people have lived through. Uh, people can talk about it, but uh, so many times I've wished I could have had my encounter to where I could have walked away. Or I could have ran away, but that wasn't my case. I had to stay there and take it. <laughs> yeah. And those trees that were setting up, was that caused by the Sasquatch? Like they broke the trees and just left them sitting up? No. Well, basically what had happened again, there was two stacks of cut timber that the logging crew was going to haul out. What had basically happened was they stacked those timbers there to be hauled away. And at the back, they had three trees for a backstop to hold those timbers in place. When I got to the rear, I, again, I seen two of those trees completely snapped over and bent down. You know, somebody somehow had pulled those trees down. And then the one on the left side was snapped off, was still holding up some of the timber. But there was another eight, ten foot above it where it was snapped off, where the trees were just sitting there. So when I walked over on that side and I, and I, I was about five foot from the edge and I jumped and landed on the next tree. That's when they all let go in the slide. So all the trees that were covering me were timber that was cut by the logging crew, ready to be hauled out. Mm, yeah, yeah, I've seen that before, where they get hung and they're held up by other trees. Is that yep. what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. so they had trees. When they put those trees there, intended to be hauled out away, uh, they had the backstop. They had, you know, they had the backstop. They had the three trees that they used, probably not knowing that somehow those trees were no longer there in place where they were at first when they put the timbers there. You know, that's what I figured because I'm looking at it, scratching my head, thinking there's no way they can stack these timbers all the way back to the back edge here. With that kind of a drop, without having a backstop, you're just rolling the dice. If they let go 200 foot straight down, they're gone. Which, in fact, they probably lost a semi load that day when those let go. But uh, I only had, when I come to a stop, I was probably, I had left the top i had went down probably 20 feet and then over the edge i was there with the three trees over me about another 20 foot down so that's where i ended up but uh that makes sense yeah i appreciate you sharing that with me and um when the creature came up the hill or when it came yeah. towards you you said you heard a boom sound or something like a thump Is that well correct? i heard what I heard was I heard I heard something. It, it felt like I well I heard snapping sounds, and then it went from that to like a thud sound, thud, thud, and then a loud thud. Where now I look back at it like it jumped, jumped from one trees and the, the trees that had let go that was laying down the hill. It was like moving basically from one to the other, working its way on up to where I was. Uh, but I could hear it. I could hear it each time. And I, of course, the only thing I could figure out is somebody from the logging crew that had noticed what had happened and they was making their way to me. You know, uh, I didn't understand the kind of noises that I was hearing, but they, they were, they were solid, solid thumps, you know, and they got louder, louder. And then 
it was a loud one. And that's when I turned my head and this thing was standing there. And again, at this point, about six foot, seven foot from me, it's standing on timbers that went over the hill. And it steps up and leans down. And when it does, that's when that's when I lost my bodily functions and, you know, tried to scream, spit and spit blood everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And um, we've been in contact since I started the channel. And I kind of wondered, like, you know, what happened to Bill? I wonder why he doesn't want to talk. Now now well, it all makes sense. It all well, makes the sense. Thing is, is the same as my friend. You're, you're one of the two or three people that I've told this story to. And uh, I just... You know, if I could get a message out there, I'd want, you know, I'd really want a lot of people to know that they're really interested in these creatures. It's okay to be interested, in, I guess, you know, but please be careful because you don't, you know, you don't know what kind of encounter you're going to have and, and you don't know what you're going to have to live with afterwards. You know? Yeah, it could so, cost somebody their life for sure. Yeah, well, you know, I believe this. Here's what I believe. After what I've lived and I live today, I believe you can run into these creatures and have a very, very good encounter. And then I believe they're like human beings. You can run into these creatures and you could be you could possibly lose your life. You know, and so, you, you know, it's a roll of the dice. You know what I mean? You just you just don't know. I, although was so far beyond terrified during my encounter. Uh, I sit here, you know, no, for a fact, I'm here today because of what happened to me. On my 17th birthday, in the Washita National Forest, being caught into a tree slide, and being crushed by timbers. I know what happened that day, and I know why I'm here. And the reason I'm here is because there was a creature that made its way to me and moved three timbers that was crushing me. And I surely would have passed. I surely would have died. There's no question. Yeah. You know, I, I couldn't live. I couldn't live another hour or two not getting any oxygen. I simply could not breathe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, that, like I said, that last tree had... I still live that. I live that where he leans over. He leans over and looks at me. He looks at me. And then when he wraps those arms around that tree, oh my God. I just. So many times I've walked up to trees close to that size and tried to put my arms around them. And I could barely touch my hands together. And sometimes couldn't at all. But well, this thing could have overlapped its hands by six to ten inches around this tree. And like I say, it was close to the, to the circumference of a 55 gallon drum. And the sound it made when it lifted that son of a. Oh my God. Oh, I could feel it through my whole body. And then when the tree, he let the tree go and it hit, my body pops up, you know what I mean? And, I know, I thought for the first time when it happened, if this thing doesn't grab me and drag me out of this place I'm laying in, I stand, a, now, now I stand a small chance of surviving, you know? And there's nothing I've ever heard better in my life than those two trucks pulling back up and come running up there. And of course, two of them had rifles, you know, because the one told them what they had seen, what, what he had seen. Uh, but there was nothing there. And they said, you know, when they came back, uh, there were signs. He said, look, like there were signs of possibly something there. But they knew at that point they had to get me out of there. And they, and it was really cool because, you know, these guys, these guys knew what they were doing when it come to, you know, getting me supported, getting me moved, calling who they had to call the right people. They had a lot of training. They were very good in it uh, because they got a guy, you know, when they're out there in those areas cutting timbers. One of those guys wind up getting really hurt. They can possibly be crushed. Uh, they got things in place, you know, uh, training that they've taken, that they know what to do. And 
Uh, so the difference, the moral of the story is the difference was after that happened to me, getting out of there in an hour and a half, being taken out of an hour and a half, less than two hours, or being there for the next eight. And luck, lucky for me, I was taken out of there with less than two hours from the time it happened. So, uh, yeah. you know. And um, people were logging down their homes, cutting down the trees, and they still had the intelligence, the compassion to save you. I hear a lot of people in the comments saying, oh, they're demons, they're they're evil, but I don't think a demon would ever save a person because if you know somebody could lose their life, I think a demon would let it happen. That way they don't have a chance to um, redeem themselves, per se. Well, you know, I tell you, Miguel, when that creature climbed up to where I was, it climbed up there to help me. And it did. The after effects of that happening, I've had to live with every day for the rest of my life. And a lot of it hasn't been fun. But I'm very thankful to be alive. You know, I'm very, life is precious. And I'm very, very thankful to be alive. It's just the price I had to pay to live. I wish upon no one. No one. You know, because it affects every aspect of your life. And, uh, you know, for me, for me, one of the best parts I lived through was going through the hypnosis regression and having two doctors who I knew did not believe me. I knew they did. And after that hypnosis regression, seeing the looks on their faces, it was, you know, redemption time. Because they knew what I had been through. It wasn't, you know what I mean? There wasn't no shortcuts there. Okay, so like when they do the regression, the truth comes out because you're in a different state and it was the same as your story. Oh, absolutely. And the three times I went through it, the first time I went through it, I lost my bodily functions. In hypnosis regression. So, no, you can go back. You can go back to the time it happened. I was kind of amazed by the details that, that came out that I didn't I didn't remember. You know, I mean, a lot of small, de a small lot, a lot of small details of my injuries that I had witnessed. I never paid attention to. Couldn't tell you about all of it was on tape. There was a lot of you know the other the other two that I had seen. Uh, one appeared to be I don't know you know a child. Uh, a small one, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I can tell you this, you know, to see something like this that you've never witnessed before, you know, I hadn't talked about this with anybody. I had never even thought about speaking about anything like this to anybody. I never witnessed anything close to it. And, you know, again, you know, back then in the 70s, you know, it's like it there wasn't no no sites like yours. <laughs> there wasn't no groups talking about it. Nobody you could go to and speak with. Uh, nobody I knew of. Yeah. You know, Bill. So it was I'm getting a little bit of feedback, but um, I'm I'm assuming you you got to get going too because your son. I heard him calling to you earlier, but um. Yes. Okay. One more question before we end the show. Have you had any um? other experiences like paranormal um other cryptids and have you seen any weird lights during your near-death experience did you see anything like any biblical beings anything like that no you know no i did not uh, i absolutely believe in it 100 percent uh because of people i know that have experienced it i had one other experience uh when i was with somebody uh that uh talked me into uh, in 2000, what was it? it? Was 2007? Talked me into going to a place in Kentucky, and uh, I I had an experience there with a cryptid. Uh, I'll never go back there. But you know, I I had yeah, I had another experience, but it it, it was a Sasquatch. It, 
it was uh, something again i never believed to exist you know it was uh, basically a dogman and uh again but at this time i was ready you know i could move i could get away and we were literally i we were literally chased back to our vehicle and uh the gentleman i was with known my whole life we got into his four by four got it turned around and as we was leaving pulling out of this area and i'm talking a secluded area that had been was a logging road that probably hadn't been used in 20 years as we're leaving there something slammed into the rear quarter panel uh, of his vehicle all virtually turned us sideways he had enough room to correct and keep going and it did over three thousand dollars worth of damage to his four by four uh never seen what it was that hit the quarter panel but it was like uh it was like uh something we never experienced but what we seen that day made us run for our lives you know and i i thank god that i was not in the position of being where i couldn't do anything i couldn't go anywhere um it's just they and now you know it was a tough thing to go through but now i know they exist and uh you know i listen to the channels where people talk about them so forth and so on the thing for me is the hardest thing for me to deal with is why now you know that's the biggest question because never heard about them in the 50s never heard about them in the 60s never heard about them in the 70s you know it just went decades went by you never heard about anything like ever you know, it'd be once in a, you know, you know, once every 10 years, you might hear a story that didn't make sense. And now it's absolutely exploded. You know, it's, it's basically taken over. I, like I said, I've, I did, you know, over 15 years, I ran across seven people. And I have documentation documentation of what they went through it's absolutely amazing on another level the same thing i went through two of them at least incredible incredible photos film got it all it's just incredible and in one case in one case this gentleman has footage of one of his horses being killed dragged out of his barn and drug away he's got it on film and he's got what did it on film too you now it's just it's things you just you know you think people you know make up for horror stories or movies you know i was talking to this gentleman i had talked to him a dozen times a dozen times over about a month and finally, we were sitting talking, and he says, "Well, you know what? You know, he says, I got something to show you." And oh my God, oh my God! It... So there's stories out there that are just, you know, encounters that people have. There, and I'm finding out, and I'm realizing that there's so many that people don't even report. They don't even talk to people about, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that won't even talk to me. They tell me that they experienced something, tell me the area, and like set up a call, and they just never get back with me. But I know they had something serious happen. Well, you, you, well, you know, Miguel, how many times they get they send in photo footage, film footage, just saying, you know, saying, oh, if it could be a little bit clearer, oh, if it could be a little bit closer, and I understand why a lot of that happens it makes perfect sense people ain't walking out to hey we're gonna see it we're, we're, we're gonna see a creature we're gonna see this happen we're gonna see that happen a lot of times they're just whipping up their phone and turning it on or grabbing their camera and, but i'm telling you the footage i talk about where this thing kills this horse you hear it you hear it killing the horse you hear it this gentleman standing out there with a double barrel 12 gauge And then his daughter comes running out. She's worried about her father. 
guess what she's got? She's got something that can basically take footage like a like a camcorder. Uh, Sometimes I forget I forget exactly what it's called, but she's got it with her, and they don't know what to think. You know what I mean? They don't know what to think. Although the man who owns the property has seen these creatures five, six, seven times, but not on his property. And this thing comes walking out of the barn with its arm around the horse's neck. The horse is still kicking one of its legs, walks around the edge of the barn, and walks all the way down the length of the barn, still dragging it, walks about another 200 feet, walks into the woods, and then it wound up going through about 75 yards of woods down, crossing the creek, and then up out of the creek. And she got it all on film. Is you this know? somebody you know personally, or is this something you found um, online? Or This is somebody I dealt with personally. Mm. I talked to, listened to what they had to say over different times. They've witnessed different things, different events, so forth and so on. But when this happened, this happened, it changed everything. I mean, it wound up putting a high-voltage fence, uh, and uh, uh, the one near the barn where he puts the animals away... And he actually uh, fires up is enough to knock an elephant on its rear end. Uh, he said, I'm going to protect what I have with everything I have. He he said at the time, when I looked at that footage, I was, my mouth dropped open. I couldn't even say a word. I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And then, and then he knew. He said, I knew shooting that double barrel 12 gauge wouldn't phase that thing. He said, you'd have to have something like a 50 caliber. He said, before you could even phase that monster. He said, that thing walking out of there. And from what I seen, between eight and nine foot tall, seven, eight hundred pounds, and it can lift a bus. And uh, the horse had drug away, I think was around. I'm not badly mistaken, around 725, 750 pounds. And uh, there, and that was picked up on film from about 60 foot away. Good lighting, everything. Crystal clear. Wow. And, you know, like I say, I got, I talked to, I, <laughs> I talked to this lady about, about a year ago. And she's contacted me. Her sister works for a uh, place in New York City, a, a publisher, want me to want me to do a book. You know, I thought, man, I got, I don't even know how how you do something like that. That's, you know, that's not for me. But it's like you have that story, and then I tell you what, I've picked up six more. Oh my god. And I'm not talking about, well, here's what I've seen. I'm talking about documentation that's unbelievable. But these people are private. These people don't want people coming in. To, and I spent a long, was, I, this took me the D7, ah, 15 years. 15 years. That's how long it took. But I knew about them. I had talked to them. I visited them, visited them, visited them. And I just wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn more, try to understand, you know what I mean? And uh, I finally ran across a gentleman who had an ongoing almost relationship with these creatures. It was incredible, you know. But for this thing to come up, go into this man's barn, kill a horse, and then, like I say, I got six more. And at least two of the other ones rival that, if not better. Incredible. Incredible. And out of the other six, four of them have footage. It's not blurry, not from a long way away. I'm talking unbelievable stuff. But uh, again, these people are like, hey, 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 hey. I, you know, they're just private. They don't, you know what I mean? They want to deal with the issues at hand, which most of them have. But it's incredible what they've been through. You know, I thought I was the only one like, oh, my God, there's people out there that have endured, you know, good. And evil, you know, and uh, it's incredible. 
It's incredible. You find it's like see when I what I was doing what I was doing over a couple of decades was I was going out of the way places, going down the pavement to a stone road, going down the stone road to a dirt road, going five more miles and run across somebody who's got forty, fifty acres. You know? And I'd stop and I'd be talking to a lot of people like that. You'd be surprised. And I wouldn't be asking them about creatures. I wouldn't be asking them about cryptids. Most times it'd come out of them. They'd start. They'd feel comfortable enough. You know what I mean? Uh, I would ease into, you know, I ran across a situation myself. I was involved in, you know, near me now, Arkansas, that blow your mind. And I just let it go. Drop it. You know, and after a while, so many times of visiting, sometimes two, three dozen times, they open up and, oh, my God, the blow your mind. Just absolutely blow your mind. Uh, so, yeah, it's like they, they, they're out there. It's, they appear to be in so many places. They, it appears there's such a population of these creatures. It's incredible. Yeah, it really is. And if you could ever talk to your friends and convince them to come on the show, I'd be glad to have them on. I know they probably don't want to, but the offer's out well, there. You know, I got I got a couple that might. I can talk to them. I really, really like to get the one uh, with the footage of uh, what took place on this property to talk to you. Yeah, uh, but I'll do, you know, I'll do, I'll try. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll try because I got basically most all their experiences on tape myself, mm. you know, and uh, they knew I was taping. They agreed to it. And, uh, but again, these, you know, there's a few of these people, they're, just, you know, they're, they're old fashioned down home country folk. And they, uh, they just deal with what they got to deal with and how they're going to deal with it. And they, you know, they don't want no hoopla. They don't want, you know, they don't, they're not in the, you know, really opening up, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. I mean, you deal with people like that all the time. But I tell you, you know, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I'm, I'm glad you listened to what I had to say. Uh, you know, it's my prayer that anybody that has an encounter with these creatures is a good one. Because let me tell you, if it's a bad one, you could be carrying baggage for the rest of your life. You know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah I've carried a boat. I've carried a boatload, you know. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry again for what happened to you. And I really do appreciate you taking the time to share your encounters and experiences with all of us. And it really means a lot. Well, Miguel, I love your show. You know, it seems you, there's a lot of, I could tell you're, you're one of these people that just lay it out the way it is. You seem to be really honest. You know, I like the way how you communicate with people, how you deal with people. Uh, and I just, you know, my story is going to be out there. I just assume, you know, have it be through you, uh, because let me tell you something. I, I never believed in anything close or remote to it. And, uh, but I had to live it and, uh, I had to, I had to live it every day of my life. So I just, uh, I hope the best for people, uh, you know, again, uh, just beware. Uh, you know yourself from what you've been through, you know, and it's, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do. You know, it's, you know, it's just, it's just what's going to happen to you. Because again, I think with most people, once they have an interaction, especially with a cryptid, they go to, their brain goes into that recalibrating. I hear a lot of people talk about how I froze. I couldn't move. That's because that brain is just, you know, Working, 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 trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? And uh, it can be a hard thing to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've had pretty pretty well um, positive encounters, and it's still affected me. And, you know, I do this channel, and people probably wonder, how do you talk about Bigfoot every day? But when you see these things, it'll really change you. And I can't imagine having a negative encounter and one where you almost lose your life. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you got the best of both worlds. I mean, you got something that changes you in, in, in so many ways every day for the rest of your life, but you get to live. And I've come to learn that living, 
you know, life is precious, very, very precious. So I, you know, I'm, I'm extremely lucky and I'm, you know, uh, you know, I, you know, I believe in God and, uh, I know if it wouldn't happen the way it happened the day for me, uh, I wouldn't be here. So I'm just going to take it at that and hope if I ever do have another encounter. Yeah, uh, I pray it's one I don't have to run away from. You know, mm -hmm. that's all I can say. Yeah, you know? the Bible says that God is close to those who suffer. So um, keep that in mind. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will. Well, Miguel, it's been an absolute pleasure. All right, Bill. Absolutely. And thank you again. And take care of yourself, sir. You too, my friend. Thank you. You have a great day. Yeah, you too. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Wow. I mean, wow. Seriously. I cannot imagine being caught up in that situation and going through what Bill experienced. And can you guys imagine, seriously, like what it would be like to have a Sasquatch rescue you from a situation of certain death? And Bill, I really do appreciate you for contacting me and sharing your Bigfoot encounter with me. I know there would be a lot of naysayers out there, but um, you sounded extremely adamant about what happened and what you went through and I can't imagine what that would be like in the past there was a girl named Carrie who shared her Bigfoot encounter and basically it was her and her friends were fishing at a river and there were big rocks being thrown into the river but yeah this kind of confirms that they are in Mena Arkansas because that's where that experience came from so they're certainly in the area the Wachita National Forest is a huge huge forest and there are certainly Sasquatch there all right if you guys can please like resubscribe and hit the bell notification to stay up to date with all my future videos and I want to thank everyone who listened to this episode today that really means a lot so thank you God bless everyone and be safe